So you guys asked for it and we're finally here with the first ride review of the Polygon Siskiyou D7 Dropper Post Edition. So these are the kind of bikes that I really wish that there were when I started riding. Really modern geometry, great spec for the money, you've got a dropper post, one by drivetrain, air fork, air shock, hydraulic brakes, all that kind of stuff that you really want when you're getting into that sport and giving you all that confidence. So if you're familiar with the Polygon Siskiyou D-Series bikes, they were probably the most popular dual suspension bike in the Australian market and what they offered was a really affordable bike that got a lot of people into the sport. It was a dual suspension that most people could afford and really enjoy. And for this year, they've really upgraded a lot of the things. They've made it more, more modern in terms of its geometry. So you've got definitely a slacker head angle, so 67.5 degrees. You've got a longer reach too, so you've got 465 millimeter reach on this size large. 436 millimeter chainstays and then a super steep 76 degree seat angle there so up to date with all the trends that you're really looking for and then, and then some other improvements as well you've got the boost axle in the rear now so it's going to make things a lot stiffer and then you've also got room for a bottle cage in the frame as well so it's a big improvement there and then there's small things as well so you got a shorter stem wider bars and all that kind of stuff to give you a bit more confidence so as i said what made the polygon really stand out in front of the crowd was the spec that you're getting for the money and that definitely hasn't changed for this year and it's actually got a lot smarter and a lot better so this model here you're looking at costs $1,899 and it's the D7 dropper post edition. So what you're getting for that money, you get a one by drivetrain. So it's an XT rear derailleur with a clutch, which is awesome to see, with a Sunrace 11 to 46 tooth cassette. It's a one by drivetrain, so one by at the front. Then you've got a threaded bottom bracket, which is always good to see for durability. Then moving on, dropper post, you've got 130 or 125, have to double check that, it's a KS dropper post. And then you've got the Southpaw style lever. Then moving on to the suspension, you've got 120 millimeters of rear suspension and the rear suspension is controlled by an X-Fusion O2 rear shock there and that has external compression lockout as well as rebound adjustment. And then up front, you've got the RockShox Recon and that has 120 millimeters of travel. It's worth noting that the rear is boost but the front isn't, so that's something to consider as well, but they've both got through axles. And that RockShox Recon has compression adjustment up the top, so you got a lockout as well as rebound adjustment down the bottom. Moving on to the brakes, you've got Shimano MT201, so hydraulic disc brakes. And then you've got a nice cockpit there too, so 780 millimeter wide bars, so that's gonna give you a lot of confidence. And I think that has a 15 millimeter rise, if I'm right. And then you've got a 45 millimeter stem, so nice and short, and really complements the reach of this bike very well. So moving on to the wheels here, you've got 29 millimeter internal width wheels so they're tubeless ready all you need to do is add the tape and then some valves and then you've got WTB tires so they're the trail bosses and they're 2.25 inch wide but they aren't tubeless so that's something to note as well and then in terms of wheel sizes the small size up into medium you can get 27.5 and then medium through to XL comes in 29. So enough talking about the bike let's get it set up take it to the pump track do some a few small jumps and get it all set up and then we'll do our first ride and then I'll come back and tell you my first thoughts. Okay, so just before we get onto the trail, I'll run you through the settings and kind of how I get to that when I'm first setting up a bike. I'll do a more comprehensive video in the future, but in the meantime, this is kind of a general gist of what I do. So I usually set the rear shock to the manufacturer's recommendations. Usually if there's no recommendations, 30% sag, that's usually a pretty safe bet. And then I ride to run it slightly on the slower side. That way, if you go off any jumps or anything like that, it's not gonna buck you. And that's kind of what I prefer. And then you can kind of speed up as you go. Then the fork, uh, just usually go by balance so I'll set it up to kind of like a rough guide or usually what they recommend but on RockShox stuff that's usually too soft, Fox stuff usually pretty close and then I'll just go for balance, I want to kind of balance feel between the two so do a few squishes and then add or take some pressure out and that's kind of the gist that I do. I don't like using sag on a fork because it's very hard to get true sag on a fork so in terms of rebound for the fork slightly on the faster side from the center with your fork, I tend to prefer running it slightly the faster side, that way it doesn't pack down, but it depends on bike and your settings and stuff like that and your weight. So my settings for this bike, again, 30 cent sag, it was 13.5 millimeters, and that was around about 170 PSI. 
and then the rebound was four clicks from close. Then the fork, running 120 psi, so that's 20 psi higher than what RockShox recommends on this fork, and that was, yeah, just a general best that I kind of got the feeling matching it to the rear. And then rebound was one click from close, so you get five clicks on this, so again, slightly on the faster side on the fork. Okay, so we're back after the ride, so let's talk a little bit about the bike. I won't go into too much detail now, I'll go mostly into detail in the full review, but we'll talk a little bit how the bike descends, climbs, just a little bit about the spec and the future plans for the bike. So I typically don't ride shorter travel bikes, but I always find it refreshing to go back to a shorter travel bike on those more mellow trails and just flick it around and just have generally more fun on the bike. They're just a bit more efficient and a bit more playful and that's always fun. So let's talk a little bit about who the bike's for. There's three main people that are gonna buy this bike. The first one being a younger rider or someone coming into the sport that's had probably their first hardtail and they're looking at upgrading to their first dual suspension bike. The second one is a more budget conscious weekend warrior. They're gonna ride mostly on the weekends but are just looking for an affordable bike that they can really have a lot of fun on and do mostly kind of XC and trail riding. And then the last one, a bit of a funny one, people that just see a dual suspension bike and assume it's a downhill bike and they can send it over anything. So when I'm reviewing the bike, I'm really looking at through those lenses of those potential customers. Okay, so let's get a little bit onto the spec of the bike. And honestly, at this price point, there's nothing that I can really fault on this bike. So as I said earlier, the drivetrain's a mixture of Shimano XC, S-Select shifter, as well as a Sunrace cassette, and it's a one by 11 setup. And that 11 to 46 tooth cassette gives you plenty of range for climbing. And this stuff's bulletproof, reliable, and pretty affordable to replace as well in the future. So it's a really great spec option there. And I tend to prefer it as an option compared to the cheaper 12 speed SRAM stuff. The SRAM stuff's a lot heavier. The cassette weighs around about 150 more grams. And that really is a lot on these kind of bikes. You want them to accelerate quickly and it does compromise the rear suspension performance a little bit as well. So I'm really happy with the drive trainer on this bike. So moving on to the suspension now, the RockShox Recon up front, it probably is my favorite suspension fork at this price point. You do have to inflate up a little bit more than what it recommends, so around about 20 psi in my experience for my given weight. But yeah, it performs really well, pretty supple off the top, nice and controlled. The only thing that you really notice is when you start to push it is a little bit more flexy than the Revelation and that kind of stuff like that. But that's entirely a different price point, so at this price point it's a really good fork. And the same can be said about the X-Fusion O2 rear shock on this bike. I've got an X-Fusion O2 on my Marion Alpine trail as well, and I've really enjoyed that shock. On this one, it's a slightly less sophisticated model, but pretty much the same. You've got the same amount of rebound adjustment, and then you've just got a lockout on there as opposed to the four clicks of adjustment on my Marion, but really supple off the top, nice and supportive, and it's a really good shock at this price point too. And another thing I really enjoyed in the bike so far is the cockpit. So it's the exact same cockpit I've got on my Enduro bike. So a 45 millimeter stem, and 780 millimeter wide bars. So nice and stable at speed, and that's what you want on these kind of bikes. A lot of confidence when you're going down on the steeps. Another thing I notice is how well the bike corners. That's mainly thanks to the geometry of the bike. So you've got a really low BB, and the reach and chainstay length really complement each other really well, and you feel very balanced on the bike. And considering the tire spec, I was pretty impressed with the cornering. For XC and trail riding, for the main intended audience of this bike, the tires will do fine. But as you start to progress with a lot of these rides that are progressing on this bike, that would probably be the first upgrade I'd do. So upgrade it to tubeless and then put some more aggressive tires on there and it'll really make this bike come alive. The same can be said about the Shimano MT201 hydraulic disc brakes. For the intended audience of this bike, they do the job pretty well, but it would be something as you start to progress as a rider that you would probably upgrade. Together with these two upgrades, this bike would compete with bikes that cost up to $3,000, which is absolutely crazy to say. And that would only be a $250 upgrade on a bike that costs $1,899, so that's pretty absurd. 
it's safe to say what you're getting for the money is absolutely insane on this bike. And the foundations of a really, really good trail bike are there. The suspension platform, the geometry, you get a dropper post, tubeless rims. That's something that a lot of bikes that cost $500 to $1,000 more can't even say. The best thing about the new D7 is definitely the frame and the geometry of the bike. But the main thing that really impressed me about the bike is the geometry that you're getting. When I'm looking at the geometry of a trail bike, the main thing that comes first is fun. That's definitely what I'm looking for the most, so I really want it to be fun on the trail. I can flick it around, have a lot of fun. The second thing, I want it to climb really well because you're gonna be using this bike in a lot of undulating terrain, so you need it to climb well up those more pinchy climbs and those kind of more pedly trails. So having that steeper seat angle really helps on this bike. And then the last thing, I want it to be stable enough, but not too stable that it starts to detract from the fun of the bike. So I really want it to be that kind of good balance between reach and going over the top and a slack head angle, but not too slack either. So it really strikes a good balance, this bike. In terms of the rear suspension, another thing that I noticed that it was nice and supple, usually in a lot of cheaper dual suspension bikes, you'll notice there's a fair bit of stiction off the top, but I didn't notice this on the bike at all. And on those chattery sections, it was really supple and it really ironed out those small bumps really well. The suspension also has a fair bit of progression in it as well, so that's really good on a trail bike, helps you pop off things and go off jumps and stuff like that. And as you start to progress on this bike, going off bigger drops and stuff like that, that progression really helps too. In terms of how the bike rode, as I said earlier, I really like the way that this bike corners. It corners really well, and as I said, that low BB really helps this bike corner really well. So if you like railing berms, this is definitely gonna be a bike for you. On faster sections of the trail, I noticed the bike was plenty stable as well. And the only time that I noticed that I was on a more affordable bike compared to say $3,000 or $4,000 bikes was on steep looser sections where the tire choice as well as the brakes did let the bike down a little bit. But as I said, this was when I was starting to push the bike and this would be the upgrades that I'd make as you progress as a rider on this bike. But as I said, if you're riding this bike purely for XE and just general riding as well, this probably wouldn't be something that you would notice. Messing around on the pump trap, jibbing, on jumps and stuff like that, the bike really shines as well. So if you're looking to do that kind of stuff like that and mess around with your friends and have fun on the jumps and that kind of stuff too, it's gonna to be a great bike as well. In terms of climbing, the bike climbs very well as well. That's mainly thanks to that really steep seat angle and the bike pedals really well. It's got a good pedaling platform as well. But as I said, mostly come from an enduro bike, so going off a trail bike, it's always gonna climb well, but it definitely did notice that it did accelerate very quickly as well. And there was minimal pedal bob, especially on those steeper sections of the climb when I was out of the saddle and really putting down the power, I didn't notice much bob at all. Overall, my first impressions of the bike are really, really good. This is the kind of mountain bike I wish was around when I was first shopping for my first dual suspension to buy. When I started mountain biking, it was usually you bought a hard towel, then you get a really bad dual suspension bike, and then you'd finally get something that was decent. So this really eliminates that middle stage. So you just go from a hard towel to a good dual suspension bike that you can really upgrade and progress on. So that's awesome to see, and it's gonna save a lot of people money and probably keep a lot more people in the sport for longer. That kind of middle stage or just moving on from your hard towel, a lot of people do give up the sport there. So if they jump on something like this, it's really gonna make them stay in the sport and really enjoy it. And as you're starting off, this is all the stuff that you want. You want a capable bike with good geometry that's upgradable, comes with a dropper post. It's gonna give you a lot more confidence when you're descending, nice wide bars as well. So it's gonna make you a lot more confident when you're progressing on the bike as well. And that's what we really want in these more entry level dual suspension bikes. And it's great to see that Polygon really listened to the criticisms of the old model and put everything that they learned from that model into the new bike. So you get in that bottle cage, which a lot of people did question about. So it's in the middle of the frame now, so you can put a water bottle in that frame. You got better geometry, that through axle on the rear. It's all the stuff that we really want on the old model and you've got that now, so it's great to see. So in terms of the future of the bike on the channel, I'm gonna ride it for a few more months so that way I can build up a proper full review for you guys. And then I'm also gonna do a comparison to the Merida 120 as well as the Norco Fluid, which I did a review of last year. And those are the, probably the three most common entry-level dual suspension bikes that a lot of people are gonna get in the Australian market. So it's gonna be great to do a comparison between the three of those. I won't give you any kind of insights now. Definitely have to wait for the full review, so I will tease you a little bit there. But in terms of value, the Polygon's got it at the moment. But in terms of the riding, we'll just have to see. So if you enjoyed this review, don't forget to give a like, also subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions about the bike or questions for me, definitely leave them in the comments below and I'll always answer all the comments that I get. And as always guys, thanks for watching.